do a little fishing during bathroom breaks. As your character is fishing, there is no way to affect the outcome. All you can do is sit there until your character has finished. Take these opportunities to have a bathroom break, or maybe make yourself a cup of tea while your character does some fishing. Over the course of the game, you can upgrade your fishing speeds and even get a trinket. That makes fishing far quicker. You can chop instead of harvest. As you see here, you can harvest by holding the harvest button, but it is very time consuming. Alternatively, you can chop your crops with something sharp and collect your foodstuffs without any loss of material. It's just quicker. Hold the throw button for manual aiming. Hold down the throw button and you can manually aim your projectiles. This is very handy for things like turrets, for cheesing the bosses and for quickly harvesting your crops. Power attacks create added weapon reach. The prickly plants will stab you if you get too close, yet sometimes your weapon will not reach unless you get very close. Instead, try a power attack where you hold down the attack button and release to extend your reach and to take down the enemy. Smash instead of search. This seems contrary to popular gaming wisdom, but smashing is more efficient than searching, and there is no downside. Here I search a bin to find two pieces of plastic and two cups, and I smash it to get two metal, I search the fridge to receive three potatoes, and I smash it to receive electronics and metal. Now I smash the bin to receive two plastic, two cups and two metal, I smash the fridge to receive three potatoes, electronics and metal. I didn't lose anything from smashing them without searching them first. I don't even miss out on experience points. In this instance, I smash up a searchable item that contains a recipe, and I still get the recipe. Smashing is more efficient than searching, and there are no downsides. You can't smash story elements. Don't worry about destroying something that may be important later. The game doesn't allow you to smash elements that are related to the story. Take this example here. For some reason, I cannot smash this toilet. Later, I destroy everything in this room except this wall. It won't allow me to smash this wall. I use the search function to read the message, and now I can destroy the wall. I run over to the toilet that I couldn't destroy earlier, I pull out the quest-related key, and I may now destroy the toilet. Use mines to get a head start on obelisks. Before you activate each leg of the challenge, lay down a few mines before you start. If you are lucky, it will take out a few of the enemies as they spawn in. Some of the others will be killed or damaged as they run through the remaining mines in their attempts to attack you. After the initial burst of activity, your best tactic is to stick near the edges and take the enemies on just a few at a time. The enemies start out with a neutral disposition, meaning they won't attack you unless you get near. Use this to your advantage to complete the challenge. Each leg of the challenge will only begin when you activate the obelisk. Use this to your advantage by going back to the campfire, refilling your throwables, and that way you can go back and lay a few mines before you start the next leg. You don't have to hold the run button. On consoles, you have to hold the run button for a second in order to toggle the run function. Having to hold it to begin with may fool new players into thinking that they have to hold the run button to continue running, but this is not true. Here, I start walking, I hold the run button for a second, and my character starts to run. Hold it again, and we are back to walking. If I tap the run button, it instigates a roll. Invent items even if you never plan on using them. Upgrade your weapon and your backpack first, and then take a look at the invention screen. If you have enough materials left over, then invent a few things. It doesn't matter which. Inventing them helps progress the game by unlocking item slots in your inventory and unlocking further inventions along the technology tree. Here is the easiest sawmill to find. 
The axe requires lumber to upgrade. There are three sawmills in the game, but the one at coordinates 1040-240 is the best one to approach. It is a fair distance away from the starting area, but it is still doable nearer the beginning of the game. You only need cold clothing to approach it, and nearby is a quest for the building kit, which allows you to build your own sawmills. Packard Family Farm is a great farming location. The farm is located at coordinates 1490-470. It is very close to the starting area. It has a campfire and a storage box. It has arable land for farming. There is a crafting table. And in the house to the south, there is a cooking station. Fill it full of farming spots with your hoe and start farming pretty early. You will need lots of foodstuffs later in the game. Consider building a sawmill and smelter near a farm. Since you are going to return to farms every now and again, you may as well build a few production buildings around there too. Consider building at Packard Farm, the one mentioned in the previous tip. Build production machines near farms. That way, you can set them running to create your desired materials, and when you return later, you have some crops to harvest and some materials to collect. Later in the game, you will probably want to construct production buildings at Tabula Rasa, as it is another location that you will probably visit fairly frequently. Here is the easiest smelter to find. This is where you turn regular metal into iron, and that into steel, and steel into titanium. It becomes very important when you want to upgrade your wrench and your axe into stronger tools of destruction. Find this one at coordinates 880-600. On the big map, you can see that it is a fair distance away from the starting area, but it is still doable as you progress from the starting areas of the game. Balance exploration with dismantling. Balance exploration with dismantling, because taken as a rule of thumb, it helps to mitigate the fact that this game punishes you for trying to dismantle an entire small area in one go. The rarest resources are spread out rather thinly across the entirety of the map. Digging, smashing and destroying a single area is often the least efficient way of gathering the resources you require in order to push forward in the game. Don't get bogged down in trying to harvest everything because it will hold back your progress. Upgrade materials are spread out all over the map. Focusing on just one area makes it difficult to collect larger amounts of rarer items. Take something like steel. The best early game way to get steel is to destroy foam poles, but that in itself means a lot of travelling because they are all over the map. Looking online for the solution to tomb puzzles. There were some tomb puzzles that I really couldn't find on my own. Consider going online to look up a few solutions to these puzzles. Also, if you are mostly way through the game and you've opened up most of the map, consider going online to look for dismantle secrets. I say this because some of the stuff they've hidden is very unintuitive. It's quite easy to get through the entire game without finding them at all. Frag Grenade or Proximity Mine to stun larger enemies. These are not damage dealing weapons. They have a very long stun window, which often gives you plenty of time to run up and boop the enemy until they die. Damage dangerous enemies from afar so you can get in close and do some damage. Also, don't forget what I mentioned earlier about how you can manually aim your grenades by holding the throw button and aiming. The sweatband trinket is overpowered. This is because the plus 10% running speed makes dangerous enemies far less worrisome. As this monster chases me, I already have a 7% speed increase that I activated using a stone obelisk. As you can see, the monster keeps catching up to me. Now, I put on the sweatbands and I run at the same rate as the monster. Also, from an efficiency perspective, it helps you save time running from one location to another. 
Plus, if you can run from danger more easily, you don't have to focus as much on building your health bar. Where is that darn gas mask? The game uses various methods to block you in or to guide your path. In the early game, you are locked behind exploration tasks or even a boss. Later though, you are blocked through needing certain tools or certain pieces of equipment to make your way through. In one case, you need a gas mask to enter a certain area. Eventually, as your various paths are blocked off, you will be drawn to this hot desert area, where you will find a quest called The First Expedition. Complete this quest to unlock the gas mask. Prioritize weapon upgrades above all others. How strong your weapons are determines how far you may progress in the game. So prioritize weapon upgrades first if you want to progress through the game at a reasonable rate. You need rare materials for a wide variety of upgrades. See how when I upgrade my weapons, some other items are no longer available for upgrade. Later in the game, there are very rare upgrade materials such as mana shards. You may spend these valuable resources as you wish on animal treats and the like. My advice is that you upgrade your weapons as much as you can first before you spend your valuable resources on other trinkets and inventions. The Lumberjack Outfit is Overpowered It improves how quickly you swing your weapon, which is great for hitting enemies twice before they can hit you once. It also makes you a more efficient dismantler. There is a marked difference between how quickly you dismantle something with the outfit on and with it off, especially if you are cutting down trees. Opt for XP increasing skills to level up more efficiently. If you can get more done in less time, then your gaming experience will improve. For that reason, opt for skills that improve your experience generation. The faster you level up, the faster you get to the next level so that you can pick another skill. After you have exhausted the experience ones, the choice is yours. But I go for the fighting perks because they make your enemy encounters less of a hassle. You don't have to rush to terminate enemies. As you play, you will pick up big blue orbs from bosses and from underground puzzles. They can be used to terminate enemies permanently, which means they stay dead once you kill them. However, enemies in most areas are not that dangerous, and during the early game they are a handy renewable resource for certain materials. You can use the blue orbs for other things in the game, rather than sending the deadly signal. And contrary to popular advice, you don't need to keep one in your inventory. You can unlock a function where you can take things out of your storage box if needed. Determining what can and cannot be built yet. Go to Options and then to Accessibility and you can toggle the Emojis function. On the Invention screen, it shows a small thumbs up symbol over the inventions you can craft right now. Otherwise, there is a green marker over the items that you can currently build. I prefer the green marker. Click on the other items and track their required materials if you are eager to build them. Don't aim when you shoot the gun. The gun gives you the option of aiming. You do this by holding the shoot button rather than tapping it. However, during regular combat scenarios, aiming the gun seems to make the shooting mechanic even more difficult and fiddly than it already is. Rather than holding the shoot button and aiming, simply lock onto the target and press the shoot button. This will cause your character to shoot and hit the enemy that you are locked onto. Watch this clip again. Note how my character is locked onto the enemy but facing away. I press the shoot button and my character whips around and shoots the enemy without me having to aim. There is no rule that says you shouldn't use the aim feature. It just seems a little redundant when the lock-on feature works so well. The material magnet is worth grinding for. Here I have my material magnet at level 1, and even at this level it picks up a fair amount of items before my backpack is full. Now I upgrade to its maximum level. Look at how much I pick up, and from how far away it is being picked up. 
the magnet is frustratingly slow to activate, but when it does, it draws things from a fair distance away. In just three runs, I'm able to collect all of this stuff. Follow the ghost deer to find a secret. The digging mechanic is fairly frustrating, especially since there's no clear indication as to where you should dig. For example, this mound on the floor isn't much of a giveaway, and this ditch here is hardly a clue. You are supposed to look for clues as to where to dig, but it still isn't easy. Digging things like graves seems to be a good idea, but as you play, you will find quests that tell you where to dig. And there are hints here and there, but it isn't as intuitive as one might have hoped. On that note, if you come across a ghost deer, follow it and it will lead you to a digging spot. The most powerful weapons are quest related. With something like the gas mask, you are unable to enter a certain location until a certain quest has been completed. The same is true of some of the game's most powerful weapons. They are invariably locked behind storyline quests. In fact, some of the most powerful weapons don't even appear on your invention screen until after you have unlocked the quest. This gaming mechanic was put in place to stop players from becoming prematurely overpowered through the unfair acquisition of the most powerful weapons. You can look up the weapons on the internet and perhaps find detailed guides on how to acquire each weapon. But the fact is the game is going to make you jump through a variety of quest related hoops anyway, so you may as well go with it, grind through the quests and allow your character to acquire the weapons in a more organic and natural way. Wait a while to complete the loudspeaker shelter challenges. Just like the timed box challenges, these things get easier the further you progress through the game. You can memorize the route to timed boxes, you can run around obstacles, avoid enemies and so forth, or you can wait until later in the game when you can clear cut a path through all the way to the timed box and make your life significantly easier. Rather than take on the loudspeaker shelter challenges early on, wait until you have built up your skills and gathered a few more CPUs before you make your attempts. You need to defeat at least one shelter in order to unlock some of the more advanced defense upgrades. Once you've done that, bide your time, level up, increase your skills, gather together CPUs, and then, once you are adequately prepared, you can start taking down the loudspeaker shelter challenges without any true risk of a massive loss. A guide on how to beat the loudspeaker shelter challenges. Place as many defences as you can afford. If you are up to level 25, you can delete your turrets without fear of losing your valuable CPU materials. Put things in the way of enemies to slow them down. And if you have rocket launcher turrets, then try to have them bunch up. Use things like mines and grenades on the last wave. Place mines in the range of guns so that enemies are stunned within their field of fire. Don't worry too much about failing on your first few attempts. You only suffer a soft death when you fail. Learn what the enemies will do, tweak your approach and try again. Note how in this example, I attack the enemies with charged attacks in the back while they are distracted in this direction. Who wants to leaf forever? The trophy achievement description says, fill eight material slots with the same type of material. As the trophy's name suggests, you are better off filling your slots with leaves. They are the most easily available resource and you have better control over which and what you pick up. If you've decided to go for this trophy but you're already a fair way through the game, consider using one of your weaker weapons in order to collect the leaves. A weaker weapon won't be able to knock down fences and walls, but will easily remove leaves from various surfaces. Again, this makes it a little easier to control what you destroy and what you pick up. How to take down enemy turrets 
Once an enemy turret detects your presence, it will hone in on you right away and will often shoot before you have the chance to run or to dodge away. When you are dealing with enemy turrets, my first piece of advice would be to install the deadly transmission. Having these things regenerate whenever you rest at a camp is inconvenient to say the least. The best approach is to lock onto the turret from far away, throw a grenade to stun it, and then run up and destroy it. Do this until you run out of grenades, go back to your camp to restock, and continue. Also, don't forget my lessons from earlier, where I demonstrate how you can manually aim your grenades, which in some cases may also help you take down some of these turrets. Turn off screen shake after getting the sledgehammer. Go to options and lower this slider to zero. Screen shake isn't so bad during most of the game, often happening during explosions and such. But when you get the sledgehammer, the screen shakes every time you hit a destructible object. It can become rather annoying, and if it bothers you too, then turn off the screen shake in the options. Set your character to Run Toggle. This was touched upon earlier. Your character starts with Run Toggle turned on. If you turn it off, you have to hold the Run button in order to run, which makes the game significantly more difficult in my opinion. In my version of the game, the camera distance is set to maximum. You can see more of what is around you when the camera distance is drawn out. When you set it to lower or to minimum, the camera is so close to your character that it makes it difficult to play the game. There is a feature called Auto Lock to Enemies. You should probably leave it on. Here, I ran up to the enemy and destroyed it without having to lock on manually. Then, as this other enemy approaches, all I am doing is charging my hit. The auto lock on kicks in, and all I have to do is release the attack button to kill the enemy. A few handy late game inventions. The materials transporter is a great late game tool because you will be collecting epic amounts of stuff and it's sometimes inconvenient having to run back and forth from your storage box simply because you've collected too much stuff. The materials transporter unloads your goods without you having to physically visit your storage box. There are a few of these compressor type inventions. Pick them up along the way if you wish. They make you slightly more efficient, which helps you save time over the long run. The monster scanner can be good. It's very good for completionists, and it can highlight areas of interest. You can see where monsters are congregating. And if you have installed the deadly transmission, then it probably indicates an area that you haven't visited yet. I rest at a campfire, run over and around to that area. I discover that not only have I never visited this area, but there is also a timed box as a reward for my exploration. Should I look online for mana shard locations? Here you see me upgrading my animal treats and as I hit level 9, it wants me to invest a mana shard in order to get it up to level 10. Now, is a level 10 animal treat really worth something as valuable as a mana shard? Perhaps later in the game, when you want to create an army of wildlife to help you fight something nasty, then perhaps consider that option. But as a general upgrade, it is pretty situational and it doesn't offer as big of a benefit as perhaps fully upgrading your material transporter or even your proximity mine. The solution is to simply get more mana shards, but they are pretty rare in this game. So the question is, do you go online to look up where to find them? I would say yes, look them up, but mostly to check on the ones that you may have missed. For example, I found this shard in a random place in the City Hall building. It is so easily missable that it seems unfair. By all means, look up the locations of mana shards to perhaps find the ones you may have missed. But for the most part, the mana shards that you haven't picked up yet are most likely in the locations that you haven't unlocked yet.
Don't forget that mana shards are a fairly late game resource, so it stands to reason that you will predominantly find them in the later stage areas of the game. Eating food to regain health and stockpiling food. Given that you have the option of health items like pills and bandages, you probably won't use this feature. Nevertheless, after getting culinary skill level 1, you can eat things out of your inventory in order to regain health. I press down on the controller and you can see at the bottom how I can press to regain a certain amount of my health. On a related note, start farming early in the game and nip back now and again to harvest and to reseed your plants. There is a section later in the game where they want you to provide epic amounts of food in order to make progress in the game. Similarly, pick up mushrooms and fruits whenever you pass them, especially the white mushrooms, which are difficult to find on their own because they exist mostly in the cold areas. Again, you will need a fairly large stockpile later in the game when you reach a place called the Ark. How to beat Gembine to get the Mana Shards reward. Beat the high score on the Gembine arcade machine and you receive coordinates for a hidden treasure that doesn't spawn until you have beaten the high score. You need to beat a high score of 54,321, aka a score of 54321. Getting the high score in this game is very difficult, so if you find a way to cheat, then I highly recommend that you do. This is a shapes-based version of a game called 2048, so if you are looking online for tips, then search for tips on the game 2048. The Chembine game is found at location readbed 1612-507. You can find it pretty early on, but you'll need the expert lockpick in order to gain entrance to the building. After hours of practice, I found my way to beating the high score twice. Here I will impart all that I learned with the hope that you can replicate my success. Similar to most players of 2048, you pick a corner. This is the corner where you are going to build your highest scoring pieces. I chose the bottom left. As the game starts, I press left and down alternatively, going left, down, left, down, left, down, left, down, until the game doesn't allow me to do it anymore. The bottom left is where I build my high scoring shapes. I also decided to use the entire bottom row as a place where I manufacture the higher scoring shapes. Think of it as a shapes workbench or production line. And since I'm using the bottom row as a place where I manufacture my higher scoring shapes, I try not to press up unless I really, really have to. In my case, the buttons I press most often are left and down. This is because in my case, I chose the bottom left and bottom row as the areas where I build my high scoring shapes. If you chose a different area, then the buttons you press most frequently will differ from mine. Since I'm building my high scoring shapes on the bottom, it stands to reason that I very rarely press the up button. My overall goal is to put the highest scoring shape in the bottom left and then try to build hexagons around or near it. In the old days, I used to try to eliminate the tiny dots as soon as I could, and it got me a score of around 30,000 which means it's a good starting strategy, but it won't carry you through all the way to the end. Your overall strategy should be to build as many hexagons as you can. On my screen, it should say the high score is 54,321. Mine says 58,375 because I've beat this mini game already. Again, my primary aim is to keep the highest scoring pieces in the bottom left and then try to build hexagons around that location. However, as the game progresses, you can see things getting a little messy as the green shapes find their way out of the corner. Watch here as I try to make hexagon after hexagon and this eventually takes me past the finish line. Just so you have another example of a winning game, 
Here is footage of the first time I beat the high score. It is a lot sloppier than the attempt I just showed you, but it just stands to prove how luck plays a big part in winning this game. With that said, there is quite a lot of luck involved in this game, and if like me, you are a completionist, then beating the game is a must. Sadly, it's going to take time, patience, and a fair amount of luck. Out of interest, if you start the game, even if it has the same configuration as mine on the screen just here, the shapes appear in different and random places each time. Which is a shame, because otherwise you could have just followed the way I completed the minigame, and then you'd be all done with this very frustrating part of Dismantle. Completing your enemies encyclopedia. If you have completed the game, but still haven't filled out your bestiary encyclopedia, it is probably because you haven't killed a vulture. Stand on a hill to kill it, or build a platform on a hill and lock on as it comes near. Also, if you want the super rare fish that is required for an overpowered trinket, then I personally found two at coordinates 1340-877. Each fishing spot can be used around 8 to 10 times before it disappears. So perhaps make a backup save or a cloud save, or perhaps consider reloading until you get the fish. Doing so is a little bit naughty, but the fish drops are completely random, which means it's possible to fully exhaust every fishing spot in the game and never receive three of the super rare fish, three being the number required to get the overpowered trinket. Why use the home portal? As you play Dismantle, there will come a time when you need to quickly visit a campfire or storage box. The home portal allows you to do this. It takes you from wherever you are to the campfire and storage box in Tabula Rasa. So let's say you need a blue orb for an obelisk challenge or you need lumber for a bridge. You simply teleport from where you are, collect the items at your storage box, and then teleport back. On the other hand, perhaps you are in a location that you haven't visited before, your inventory is completely full, and you've run out of material transporter uses. You could, if you wish, run to the nearest campfire and restock, or you can use your home portal, teleport to Tabula Rasa, use the campfire there, and then teleport directly back to wherever you started. It's a lot more convenient and obviously a lot faster. Dismantle is a good game. I'd say this game is better enjoyed if you play a little bit each day rather than binge playing for several hours. The thing is that after hours of playing, progression starts to feel like work. However, if you play a little bit each day, then you get the same tweak of achievement without any feelings of grind or tedium entering into the picture. Dismantle took me a long time to complete because I kept abandoning it and then coming back a few weeks later and trying again. Dismantle is a very grindy collectathon game, which may sound like a criticism, but it really depends on the sort of mood you're in when you begin your gaming session. Sometimes you want a fast action racing game, other times you want a long drawn out story, sometimes you want to shoot things, and sometimes you want to collect things. And I think as a grindy collectathon, Dismantle gets a lot of things right. So, thank you Ten Tons Limited and Do Cool 